Hidey ho, neighborinos. Hopefully my throat will hold out for uh, long enough for me to actually do this section. I haven't been talking much over the last couple of days. By, by deliberation, for those of you who, of course, are watching this YouTube and wondering what the heck I'm talking about, I have been exceptionally sick the last few days. I technically still am. I have already had to basically cancel uh, an exploration that was scheduled because of not being able to speak properly. Uh, so forgive me for just kind of being here in what is effectively my PJs. Uh, trying to recoup. First thing I want to talk about, and I want to hit this uh, pretty much smack dab off of the beginning, is... Well, actually, actually, you know what, let's not do that, let's not do that. Let's give it a minute or two. Um, so some people have asked if I'm going to keep doing the trailer thing in the background uh, with regards to the lore week. And after some serious thought on the matter, I've kind of decided not to. Uh, that kind of worked for that first lore week because we had several games that were being announced. It was right before E3, after all. And if I have further things that I want to showcase that are being announced, like here's a trailer for blah, 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 then I might do that in the future. But I don't think I'm going to make that a regular feature of the show, of uh, this particular segment. It doesn't really fit all that well. So instead you're going to get me with the uh, the spinning globe back there, as per usual, and Firefox telling me to upgrade, even though the upgrade screws up Firefox. Um, <clears throat> I have no idea what my voice sounds like right now. I'm so stuffed up I can barely hear myself. Um, another thing I want to talk about really quick. Uh, please, please do not immediately complain when those notes aren't up about the timestamps. Uh, I can't actually put up the timestamps properly until the video is already uploaded. And I had people complaining about no timestamps within minutes of the video uploading, so I was actively working on making the timestamps. And then people are like, well, where's the timestamps? So please give me a few minutes <laughs> before you start complaining. I swear I'm working it. I've got my pen and paper this time right now. I'm not, I'm not as out of it as last time. So I'm going to actually be taking notes about timestamps and, and giving those so that people can be like, hey, I can click here and find the specific news point that I actually want. <clears throat> ah, pardon me. Now, before we do anything else, uh, I have one thing I uh, one thing I wanted to talk about pretty much right at the beginning, like I mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and make a timestamp here for that one. <sighs> I, I hate to start on a downer, but honestly, I want to make this absolutely 100% clear, okay? It sucks when someone dies. Pax and I have a long-standing discussion about that point, that it's ju it just sucks. It's not that he or I don't empathize, quite the contrary. He and I both care a great deal when this kind of stuff happens. But after a while, you get to the point where saying anything more feels excessive, especially if you didn't have a personal connection to the individual. Now, if you do have a personal connection to the individual who died, by all means, talk as much as you want to. I actually threw up a video when Leonard Nimoy died because I'd met the man, and the man had a significant impact on me personally, and therefore I wanted to, to share that with you guys. I was in tears over that one. Um, for those of you, of course, who have not heard, Anton Yelchin died uh, last week in a rather horrible and uh, unpleasant death that, based on the evidence, uh, he probably died slowly. And that's horrible. And that's why we have no music playing yet, because I wanted to give just a moment of silence in honor of Anton Yelchin and his passing. Like I said, it sucks. Unfortunately, that is not all I have to say about that issue. What I do have to say about the issue is that people have already, within the last day, so within less than a week, have decided to turn his death into a means to make money. And that upsets me on a deeply personal level, to an extent that I cannot vocalize. For those of you not aware, they are attempting to sue uh, Fiat Chrysler, which is the overarch which is the umbrella company uh, that make his, made the vehicle that he was crushed under, do keep in mind, we don't 100% know what happened yet. We may never actually know 100% what happened. They are still investigating. But they're trying to sue them for two things. Now, the first thing is they want them to recall and repair all the vehicles with the damaged uh, gear shaft assembly or something. I forget the exact part, but there's a, apparently a, a flaw with one of the designs of that vehicle. 
it is worth noting that those vehicles were already under recall. In other words, the only thing that was actually preventing people from getting those parts replaced already was that people hadn't brought them in to get replaced. But now they're insisting they get them replaced. Okay, fine. You want to involve the system because you're an idiot. Sure. Then they want $5 million. What? Yeah, they are suing for what is uh, damages. And for those of you who are not aware of what that means, when you're suing for damages, it means this is a monetary amount that approximates how much this has injured me in my life. And therefore, I am suing for a blank number. And it's always some ridiculously high number uh, is damages. And that's basically money that they just give to you. It's uh, practically blackmail. Now, it's not like damages don't have their purpose in existing. There's a reason the concept of damages exists. However, I have personally never seen a case where someone has been sued for damages where it wasn't just, I want money. I'm sure they exist. I'm sure there's some exception somewhere where someone is sued for damages because they needed the money. I've never seen it. Not once. In real life, I should clarify. Uh, in fiction, usually when someone's suing for damages, it's because they're in the right. Uh, yeah. Five million dollars. Now, <laughs> I, I don't even know what else to say to that. That's disgusting. That's abrasive. It's unnecessary. And the fact that it's happening so quickly after his death, is extremely tasteless, as, as Meadfist points out. And the fact that it's happening without knowing that this f damaged part is the thing that's actually the problem that, that caused his passing, that to me says that this is not about people who are scared or worried about their vehicles uh, malfunctioning. This is about people wanting money. It is naked, blind greed. And if there's one thing that has always disgusted me my entire life, ever since I was a kid, it is naked greed. Hi, Guido. And hi, Azure, and hi, Meadfist, and hi, Absurdy, and hi, Vandalia, and hi, Tequita. <sighs> Within less than a week, I just... I... So I wanted to hit that first. Because that's the that's the the worst thing I've got to talk about. Uh, let's go and talk about the new Stargate. Uh, let's get some music going now that now that we're past that. Ah! Wrong song. Wrong song. There we go. Okay, so now that we're on with that, let's talk about Stargate. For those of you not aware, Stargate is an awesome franchise. I highly recommend. By the way, tell me the audio. I'm trying something new with the audio, so give me a uh, audio balance uh, feedback. So. Uh, Stargate's an awesome franchise I recommend to any fans of sci-fi. Uh, there's the first movie, then there's SG-1, which kind of goes over into uh, Atlantis, which kind of goes over into Universe, okay? It's all one continuity. The ones I strongly recommend are the original movie in SG-1. I sort of rec I still do positively recommend Atlantis. I kind of recommend Universe. Universe was cut off artificially, so it had some issues. Um, it very much feels like an unfinished show to me. But, uh... Okay, no problems on it. Can you hear the, the, the music in the background? That's that's the real question. Because um, it's a quiet song. Excuse me. Uh, hey, Lexmix. What's up? Now, I can turn it up a bit. As I say, this is so quiet, I can barely hear it. Um, so here's uh, my personal opinion. I think SG-1 is the best, followed by Atlantis, followed by the first movie, followed by Universe. That's just my personal opinion. It is worth noting I have not seen all of SG-1. I've, I've mentioned this several times. It is something that I want to do in the future. Um... I just have not had time, and, you know, and we've been busy with a million other things. Most of the time when I watch a show, it's uh, for the show. Um, but the relevant point is, originally, the Stargate movie was intended to be a trilogy. This is actually, this is not new. We, we've known this for some time. But instead, pretty much immediately after working on Stargate the movie, they went to working on Independence Day. And if you actually look at Independence Day, you can see the similarities, because Independence Day, in basically every way, is Stargate 2. Same creative staff, 
same structure for the overall plot design, a lot of the same uh, intentions. I don't know, Ventures. I'll never be able to know. Uh, I will admit, Universe never really caught me like the other ones, though. So it might just be that, regardless of it being unfinished. Um, so, Independence Day, if you really step back and analyze it from a purely uh, structural perspective, you could see the similarities between it and the first Stargate movie. Um, and it has been theorized for many years that what they did was they actually adapted their, their script for Stargate 2 into Independence Day. I don't know if that's true or not, that's just speculation. Um, Independence Day, for the record, I do actually like that movie quite a bit, but that's not here or there. The point is, prior to Independence Day 2 coming out, so this is obviously slightly old news at this point, they said, we want to finally release Stargate 2. But the thing is, in their own words, I'm paraphrasing, we, uh, you can't just go back and make a sequel to a movie 20 years later. <laughs> uh, so instead, they're going to reboot it, and they're going to completely ignore the show and they're going to completely ignore original canon in its entirety and just say, you know what, we're making a brand new Stargate series, and they're intending to make a full trilogy like they originally did. Now, on the one hand, speaking as someone who finds the Stargate movie to be somewhat lacking compared to some of the more human elements of the show, I don't know. I don't know what I can think about that. Also, it's a reboot, and I've talked about this recently. We've kind of had a lot of reboots in recent years, and it's just kind of... However, let's give credit where credit is due. First of all, I do like his team. Roland Emmerich and his team, they're good at what they do. You know, I, I'm someone who liked 2012. I'm someone who liked uh, The Day After Tomorrow. Actually, I don't know if 2012 was him, but I know Day After Tomorrow was him, and I liked Independence Day, and I liked the first Stargate movie. He's really good at the cheesy, corny, embracing, over-the-top, silly, fun, adventure kind of thing. Uh, better than Michael Bay would be at, the, at what is effectively the same genre, I would say. And uh, so I'm not automatically negatively inclined, and Roland Emmerich has gone out out of his way to say that he does think the Stargate show is good. He may be just doing this for PR reasons. We don't know. But at least he is willing to say, up front and open, I think the show was good. I just, you know, it was done by other people and I don't want to try and follow that continuity. Um, and there is a degree of logic to that. However, the creative person in me looks at that and says, well, at that point, you're basically just being either selfish or lazy. Because you either don't want to actually continue following uh, the original continuity because you want to do your own story, selfish, or you don't want to bother to put the time and effort necessary into understanding the existing continuity to do your own story, lazy. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in a mixed bag on this one. I'm not sure what I think uh, about this. I have to admit, I am not super excited, though. This is not an announcement. It's like, oh, dude, there's a new Stargate movie. No, it's more like, oh, by the way, there's a new Stargate movie. Shrug. But this also gets back to the whole continuity issue in general, and I don't want to retread that ground again. We've talked about continuity a few thousand times on this show, and uh, you guys know I'm generally in favor of it, and, and just tossing out continuity abstractly is never something I'm really in favor of. Cough. Disney cough. So, moving on. Moving on. Let's talk about Burger King. I know what you're thinking. Huh? Burger King? Yeah, so, Burger King. Did you know that they're releasing mac and cheese filled Cheetos at Burger King soon in certain select stores? Mac and cheese filled Cheetos. <laughs> hey, Andre. You might be wondering why I'm bringing this up on a show that's all about geek culture. Well, I do actually have a thought on this, and it's called, This Is Why You're Fat. Now, I'm not insulting anyone by that statement. That is the name of a website which showcases really disgusting food. And yet, the thing is, one of the things I've always found fascinating about thisiswhyyourefat.com, feel free to look it up yourself right now. The site hasn't been updated in forever, but it's still there last I checked, which was about a couple months ago. Um, if you go to the site, you'll see all sorts of food that's just absolutely over-the-top disgusting, and then you'll see some food that's like, oh, that, that looks pretty good, actually. And that 
concept right there is what I wanted to talk about. Acceptability with regards to intake of food completely varies based on the individual. Like, I might look at, for example, uh, oh, shush, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm the fat one here, although I'm working on losing it. As soon as this sickness goes away, I'm getting back to my new improved exercise regime, which is going to be killing me, but I'm going to do it anyways, because damn it, I want to lose my weight. Hey, Sonashi. Uh, so, the acceptability line with regards to food is something that's especially important when it comes to geeks. Now, I find this interesting, again, because geeks are just as varied as everyone else is. Oh, by the way, for those of you who have never seen me say this, use this word, I use the word geek as a positive term, not a negative. So I just want to make that, that statement clear. Uh, if I call you a nerd, that's a negative term from my perspective, but geek is a positive perspective. Um, uh, so, yeah, like for example, the, the, the mac and cheese filled Cheetos, that actually sounds pretty good. I'd be willing to try that. I got a Burger King right over there. I might go over and hit them and see if they're one of the ones that sells it. After I'm better, of course. But that acceptability line is directly related to geek culture because geeks themselves, you would not believe how many arguments I've seen amongst geeks about what is acceptable to eat or not. There's actually an entire subculture of what you can eat during what kind of... I mean, how many of you have played a pen and paper game? Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Friday Night Fire Fright, Fight, Friday Night Fire Fight. Um, you know, uh, I can't think of anything else all of a sudden. Any, any pen and paper game. Uh, God, my brain just died there. Uh... I can't think of any others. I suddenly get... There's one that's based on D6s. I've played it. Uh, GURPS. That's it. GURPS is another one. Um, Cyberpunk 2020 is another one, you know. Anyways, my point is, how many times have you sat down at a pen and paper game and you've been like, why don't we go... Yeah, Pathfinder is another one. You've been like, why don't we go play... Why don't we go get some food for the game? And then an actual, genuine argument breaks out on what to eat because certain things are more acceptable for certain geek-like activities. For example, let's say I'm playing a video game on my PC. Keyboard, mouse. Both of my hands are basically taken, and I don't want to get them filthy because... This is my perspective. I don't want to get them filthy, so I'm only willing to eat stuff that's non-greasy or non... You know, it's not going to leave crumbs all over the place, right? And yet some people are completely on the opposite side of that. They're like, oh, whatever, and they'll get crumbs all over the place and get crumbs in their keyboard. I actually know someone personally who's like this, who doesn't give a damn about this, right? Um, so it's like, yeah, sure, have fun with it. Uh, and then, of course, some people say that you can't have a real meal while doing that. You know, you have to have something like pizza or whatever while playing pen and paper, for example. And yet I've actually, and this is funny because Dark Ride got there before I did, I have had, like, like steamed rice and, and, and fried chicken and whatever, you know, uh... Or, or fried fried <laughs> fried rice with steamed chicken. I'm saying that completely wrong. Um, and I actually had a real meal while playing pen and paper. And people are like, "What? You know, why would I do that?" And it's just fascinating to me seeing this because I've already seen people bring up these new Cheetos. After all, Cheetos are one of those stereotypes with regards to geeks and having the the orange covered fingers and all that stuff. You know, and it, even with the orange covered finger stuff. I, you would be surprised how many geeks I've seen personally who refuse to interact with their, their various hobbies, whatever it is, whether it be cards, or board games, or their character sheet, or their, 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 their controllers, or their keyboard, if they've got stuff on their fingers. They will insist on getting up and going to the bathroom, or going to the kitchen and washing off before they come back and like, okay, hang on, I'm ready, sorry about this. And this is actually one of the reasons why some food like that is actually banned from some tables. Anyways, I just wanted to bring it up because I find the whole thing fascinating. No no actual judgment here, no positive or negative. It's just interesting to me that the whole, this is food that is acceptable, this is food is not, is such a morphic dynamic line between everyone. And I find that interesting. Hey, Corrales. So, for those of you not aware, Yacht Club, Yacht Club Games um, has released the first few tidbits of, I don't like Cheetos at all, personally, but that's neither here nor there. Yacht Club Games has released the first few bits of info regarding Spectre Knight and the playable Spectre Knight campaign. Uh, it looks awesome, first of all. Uh, everything I've seen so far, it's not much. And they have mentioned a few things they are pushing in the future, including a King Knight campaign, a gender swap mode, and a fully competitive PvP mode. Um, and that's all cool. 
I'm definitely down with that. Uh, this bring the, you might be like, well, why am I bringing this up? Uh, <laughs> first of all, yeah, when Plague Knight came out, Plague Knight was basically a brand new game. It, really, let's just be honest about it. Plague Knight was obviously built on, excuse me, on the on the baseline of Shovel Knight. It was, but it was an expansion. It was in every way that counts an expansion to Shovel Knight. But it was free. People who owned Shovel Knight just got it. That is an unheard of business model. Can you name any other game out there that has given out a full tilt, cannot deny it, cannot, you know, technically it into an expansion or a DLC or whatever. It was a full tilt expansion and was given out for free. And there's no subscription cost involved either, by the way. That's a totally different business model. Here's the reason I bring this up. Uh, Terraria? That's news to me. What did Terraria release? <laughs> uh, no, Witcher 2 absolutely does not count for what I'm talking about. The Expanded Edition was a polished version, but that's, I mean, shrug, you know. That's like the uh, Director's Cut of Wasteland 2, which you got for free if you owned Wasteland 2. That's not what I'm talking about. This An expansion really is a, a different thing over here. Um... And this goes back to my talk about what I've said many years about what an expansion really is and why I've always been in favor of the idea of expansions. You, we've already got the engine. The engine works. Make new content for it. And that was what Plague Knight was. Um, and that's what Spectre Knight most likely will be, and that is most likely what King Knight will be as well. The reason I bring this up, other than it being awesome and trying to get people hoiped for it, by the way, I do plan to stream Spectre Knight when it comes out, is the fact that how are they paying their bills? Now, okay, here's Reality Land for a second. The reason these things are coming out and coming out for free is because they were a part of uh, stretch goals, okay? So, I'll, I'll take your word on it, Andre. Uh, Terraria never clicked with me. Uh, story expansion, Darkrai. So, multiplayer expansions don't are, are actually a different thing, and I'm not saying that to be derogative. They just are. Um... Multiplayer expansions being free content are expected. So, I keep losing my train of thought. Um, stretch goals, okay? Now, the way this works from a behind-the-scenes perspective is you've got, you're like, you know, this is how much... Uh, I don't own a PS4, love Disney. Love Disney. <laughs> so, here's how much money we estimate it will take to make the game. But if we make this much, we'll do this, and we'll make this much, we'll do this, okay? Now... The only way a stretch goal can work is with proper planning and budgeting. In other words, you have to accurately predict how much money it will take you in order to actually continue operating as a company. People still need to be getting paychecks after all, right? Those people still need to get paid. They have bills to pay. They have families to feed. They still need to be walking home safe and secure and knowing that they still have their salary. So they have to keep making that salary even though they're not selling copies of the game at this point. I mean, they, there might be still copies of Shovel Knight that are selling, but the point is, the majority of the copies of the Shovel Knight have already been sold. You know, that that those are basically sunk at this point. So they have to keep operating, and the, so my point here is that with proper accounting and with proper precognition, with stretch goals, you can predict, hey, this is what, this is how much money we'll need to keep operating for how much time we think it'll take to push out Plague Knight and Spectre Knight. And yet it's been in the year and years range, and it will continue to be in the years range since Shovel Knight came out. Do you kind of understand the problem here? Because... We don't know if Yacht Club Games is working on anything else. There has been no news whatsoever if they're working on any other game. They might be. I, I don't actually know. But to my knowledge, they are not. Assuming they are not, those stre that stretch goal money is the only thing keeping the lights on at their offices and keeping those people working on it. After a point in time, they will run dry of money. That's how that works. And if they run dry of money, what are they going to do? And this is really the reason I wanted to bring this up. We've, we're going to be talking about a couple of economics things today. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say for last, because I really don't want to talk about it that much, but I have to bring it up. Um, like I said, with proper budgeting and planning, that can happen, but I kept saying that with such a weird tone, because anybody who's done any kind of accounting, budgeting, or planning with regards to finances knows you're never going to be right. 
the best possible thing you can do is overestimate so that you have more budget than you need. And it's entirely possible they did exactly that. That they are financially fine for the next several years, or however long it takes, for them to finish pushing out this inform this stuff. And so then... I actually don't know, Ventures. I really don't. I have no answer for that question. <laughs> um, so, for the however many, next, next many years they are continuing to work on this product, uh, they are still getting paid, basically. Imagine if they had done that wrong. Or worse, imagine if they get pigeonholed now. What I'm trying to say is I disagree with, with stretch goals. That's actually what I'm building this to. The economist in me disagrees with the idea of stretch goals. Because a stretch goal automatically presumes that money equals product. And that's not necessarily true, because there has to be time, there has to be creativity, there has to be lack of issues. There's so many things that could go wrong. What if, in a few months, half of Yacht Club Games ends up leaving the company? What are they going to do about those stretch goals at that point? And I'm not even saying, like, leaves the company in a bad way. What if they leave amicably? What if they decide to go and make their own product? What if they're tired of working on Shovel Knight? They want to do another project. There is such a thing as creative fatigue, after all. And again, Plague Knight was a full-tilt expansion. Practically a brand new game. And that's amazing. But that takes creativity. And if there's one thing I've learned working on this show, it's that creativity is a finite resource. After a while, you lose the ability to be creative, and you just kind of run dry on the well, and it's like, ugh. And I feel that stretch goals are a little bit too... I, I feel like there's too much expectation on stretch goals, and I feel like there's too much of a bias that stretch goals are basically, here's more money, give us more stuff. More money can equal more stuff, but more content, that's a little bit... That's a little bit iffy of a situation. Uh, at least on the PC, the only platform I own Shovel Knight for, yes, the expansions are still free. We will be getting Spectre... They've even said it flat out, Spectre Knight will still be free, King's Knight will, uh, will still be free, um, the gender swap mode will be free, and the PvP mode will be free. Now, on the one hand, that's awesome that they're doing that, and I want to support them in that. I mean, you know, I, I want them to continue do, doing good stuff. But again, that whole... Oh, 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 oh. Actually, we hit the 21-minute mark. We ran out of music. Uh, let's change over to here. Um, on the other hand, I don't want Yacht Club Games to be the people who made Shovel Knight, and then the company fell apart. I don't understand that question, Meat Fist. Like, I really don't. If it, and Now, if, granted, the idealist in me says if you have to bribe people with additional content to make them back the game to begin with, then we're already at a flawed situation. I don't know, Venters. People tend to be very, and I hate to use this word, but it's true, entitled. Uh, and it's entirely possible that people would look at that and say, How dare you charge for this game, and how dare you do this, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'd, I'd pay for it. I have no problem paying for quality goods. You may, If you tell me it's free and then charge me for it, I'll be a little upset. But if it's still a quality good, then here's my money, you know? But I am not most people, and so I'm not the person to talk about that. Um... It is also worth noting that part of the problem with the whole stretch goals thing is that some of them get ridiculously unrealistic. Oh, by the way, just to add as an aside, part of the reason I'm upset that Yacht Club Games is still working on their second of four expansions, or one, two, excuse me, three, three expansions for this game, see you around, Azura, is because they've already said the next type of game they want to make. They want to make a Chrono Trigger type game. They've already given some thoughts on it, and inf and a little little t bits of information. And it's like, oh, well, that sounds awesome. That might happen in, like, years at this point, because they're still working on Shovel Knight. <sighs> well, Meadfist, uh, I suppose the option of getting the initial release thing, you know, a free copy or whatever, would be your benefit of backing it at that point, Meadfist. Now, see, the thing is, I speak against stretch goals, but what I, I really want to make this statement clear. What I'm speaking against is additional content in stretch goals. That is a completely different thing than you get a free copy of the game, or 
you get uh, like the art book thing that was just mentioned or whatever. Yeah, of course backing's a risk. Backing is gambling. Most people don't seem to understand that backing literally one-to-one -one, is gambling. You don't know if the game you want is coming out. You don't know if the game's coming out, period. You don't know if that money is getting sucked into a va vacuous void and will never be seen again. That, and I feel that's another thing that Kickstarter needs to be more blatant and more obvious about. This is a risk. Too many people seem to think backing is just flat up, oh, well, I'm buying the game, or I'm making sure the game gets made, which is not true. Now, all of this sounds like I'm against Kickstarter. Let me make this statement clear. I actually am in favor of Kickstarter. I think crowdfunding is a great thing, and I think it's basically the new uh, idea of how things are going to go in the future as far as funding. I think there are ways to polish the crowdfunding model in order to make it a little more coherent, because right now, as I just said, it is gambling. However, I am in favor of it. I want to keep pushing it. I want it to keep going forward. But that's part of why I am critiquing it. Remember that most criti criticism comes from enjoyment of a thing, not hatred of a thing. At least proper, uh, genuine criticism. Uh, I actually don't know how big Yacht Club Games is off the top of my head. I don't think they're big. I think they're like a hundred some squad, but I'm not sure about that, so... Mm. Uh, what's it doing? Okay, so uh, that's actually all I gotta talk about on that one. Uh, what time are we at? So unfortunately, I can't talk extensively about my next topic. I was kind of hoping to have finished the game by now. Uh, Mighty number no. 9. Mighty number no. 9 is an excellent example of how Kickstarter can go both good and bad. Let me start by saying that I have enjoyed Mighty number no. 9 so far. Legitimately, I have had very I have had complaints about it and I have had positives about it and I want to play more. However, that uh, Mighty number no. 9 is an excellent example of how a Kickstarter campaign and promises about money and finances and whatnot can go wrong, especially because of the fact that most people don't understand where that money goes. Um, I forget the exact breakup. Someone uh, more intelligent than I released an exact breakup, percentage-wise, of where the money from Kickstarter goes. Do keep in mind that, like, say, let's say we push, po push in $100,000 for a game to come out. They don't get a check for $100,000. First, money is taken out by Kickstarter itself. Then there's money taken out by licensing fees and a few other legal paperwork side of things. And then from that money, taxes are pulled out because that is taxable income. Okay? For once those three categories of things are pulled out of the thing, then they have the money that's left over, which then has to go to other things like publishing and distributing and marketing. And then, from that, what's left over is the money that actually goes into the construction of the game itself. It is broken down a lot more than, uh, than most people seem to think. Uh, granted, economics is always one of my big things, so I tend to follow this kind of thing a little more closely than others. But I've noticed many, many times people are like, you know, you, you got this huge sum of money. Why, why is this game, you know, not that? And the harsh reality is the fact that they don't get all that money in order to make that game. And, here's another little fact that some people don't seem to understand. Money does not equal quality. Money equals the availability to produce, not quality of the, of the in, uh, intended product, right? Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. If you, let me just give me an example. If you get a hundred talented, skilled, brilliant developers and tell them to make a game, and give them the money to do it, you'll probably get a pretty good, uh, uh, you'll probably get a pretty good, uh, product, right? But if you take, but the expectation from everyone else, from, from, from people who don't understand how this works, is that it doesn't matter the, if those people are talented and creative, whatever, because let's say there's these other hundred people who you give like five times the amount of money you gave this first group, and the expectation is that this second company, which is filled with people, but they're not nearly as creative or driven or talented, the expectation is because they had more money, the product is better. And that's not how that works at all. Money is important to the situation, but money does not directly translate into quality. It never has in all of human history. Actually, yes, I do, Venters, legitimately. Uh, and I would have backed it, too. 
ignoring the fact that I'm actually a defender of Kingdom of, a Kingdom of Anima, because I actually thought it was a good game. <laughs> like, one of the only people who thinks that. Um, so, there's this expectation that with Mighty Number no. 9, with the 4 million backing, it should have been a great game. That is not how that works. The problem here, opinion, the problem here is that Inafune has never been why Mega Man is good. Look at Mega Man 9. Look at Mega Man 10. Those are amazing Mega Man games. I would argue they are basically some of the best Mega Man games, classic Mega Man games, ever, that have ever been made, okay? Inafune was involved in those games, but only a little bit. Those games were made by people who were just quality developers. I've, I've, I've said this for years. Some of you didn't believe me. I actually got a, a tweet or two over the last week saying, I never believed you about Inafune, but you've proven me wrong. He is not that skilled of a guy. He is not that big of a deal. He, they, he, they just, him and his team wanted to make a Mega Man game, and they succeeded at that. $4 million does not suddenly make them make a great Mega Man game, because that's not how that works. Now, is that acceptable? Is that dismissible? No. That is something we should bring to task. But again, keep in mind that $4 million that we paid is not what they got. What I'm trying to say here is I'm just trying to gray out the situation a little bit. Because too many people have been so harshly negative towards Mighty Number no. 9 specifically. Hey, Sergey. What's up, dude? Uh, too many people have been universally negative towards Mighty Number no. 9. And let's be honest, the game is disappointing. I will freely admit that. I had fun with the game. I'm looking forward to playing it again. And I'm still disappointed by it. And it's understandable. Like Mead Fist says, the expectation when you give someone more money is that you get more quality. That's just duh. But that's not how it works. That's never how it's worked. Let me give you a food example. If you go to a nice restaurant and you spend, oh, excuse me, spend like $80 getting a steak. And it's an okay steak. Like at a, at a 1 to 10, it's like a 5 out of 10 steak. And then let's say the next day, because you, you have tons of money for some reason, uh, let's say the next day you go to, I don't know, uh, a more normal steakhouse, and you get a $40 steak. The expectation in the human mind is that that will be half the quality. But that $40 steak, uh, let's say you go to a real proper steakhouse for that, is actually better. It's like a 7 out of 10. That's reality right there. We as human beings expect to, to get a return on our investment, even if we are not thinking of it as investors. That is how we function. How many times has every single one of you, individual people, gone to the grocery store and looked at a product and said, well, this is worth blah, 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 and then you judge whether or not you're going to pick up that specific fruit or canned good or meat or whatever in the grocery store because of the price. Because you think, well, this is more expensive, or this is less expensive, and this is worth it, but this is not. You expect better quality for more money. But reality has never agreed with that. There are occasions where you get better quality for better money. But it's not the norm. Oh, excuse me. I feel my throat slowly going out on me. <laughs> um... Uh, so, this brings us back to Mighty Number no. 9. I do intend to, to talk more about this in the future, but this I feel this is one of the reasons Mighty Number no. 9 has been so negatively received. Because it was a Mega Man game. An average Mega Man game. I, I've already said I put it right about alongside Mega Man 4, which for me is one of the, the most average uh, Mega Man games of the classic Mega Mans. And nowhere near on the quality level of most of the Mega Man X uh, games. I can barely hear my own voice. I am so stuffed right now. I can barely hear anything. Um, so, I will talk more about Mighty Number no. 9 in the future. I intend to continue the exploration. Um, I do want to, you know, finish the game, like I said. But, uh, regardless of that fact, I will say only this. I think it would have been amazing if Inafune had looked at the amount of money coming in and said... Huh. And then gone to the people he knew were the creative talents who could make a truly amazing game and said, hey, we need to make this amazing Mega Man game. Like, just off the top of my head, the creative team that made Mega Man 9 and 10. 
which were very creative, very inventive, very varied level design, with a great deal of variety in weapons that had utility use as a, in addition to combat use, and said, hey, we want to make a great Mega Man game. And that's not what happened. Yeah, moving on. Uh, what's my next point? Oh, I want to skip over that one for now. What's my next point? Um, hmm. For those of you not aware, uh, something happened with Boogie2988. My heart goes out to him. Uh, with regards to his YouTube channel. Boogie himself seems to be confident. I say seems because we don't know 100% what's talking about him. That things will work out for him. I hope things will work out for him. Uh, I very, very much hope things will work out for him. Uh, he will probably have to actually call YouTube and actually make some kind of a more personal presentation to them to, to undo things. I don't actually have much to share on this. I don't want to give it too much uh, f attention because that's the only thing that people like that actually want is attention. Oh yes, I did this thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yes, several other large YouTubers uh, also got hacked as well. Um, supposedly, whoever it is got a hold of their phone numbers. I'm not really sure how that even managed, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. Uh, for example, if you were to try to find, well, you know, uh, I, I don't know. The point being that this is one of those weird situations because the only thing that actually prevents that the people who did this from, say, being punished for it is the fact that the money is not there to, to punish them for it, if that makes any sense. Uh, speaking as someone who's worked at a white hack, uh, as a white hat many, many times, let me just say that there is no such thing as a hacker who can get away with it if there is sufficient cause and reason to go after them for it. They will always be caught, 100% of the time, if there is sufficient motivation to catch them. But that motivation also requires time and money, and that's always the issue with that. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, it's such a hot-button issue uh, in amongst the, the, the networking community, and why there's so, so many white hats that work out there in order to try and defeat those people, in order to, to prevent them from accomplishing what it is they wish to accomplish. There are a surprisingly large number of ways of working your way through, uh, working your way through defenses. As ever, uh, internet defense, you know, engineering, electronic defense is there to basically keep out innocent people, people who are not actually interested in causing you harm. I will say only one other thing on this subject, because I just kind of wanted to bring it to people's attention for people wondering what's up with Boogie. Um... First of all, I do like Boogie2988. He's actually a cool guy. Uh, I don't like Francis at all. <laughs> I don't even watch the Francis stuff anymore. I haven't in a long time. But I like Boogie2988 himself. He's pretty cool. Um, I hope he's having fun at the convention right now. I uh, I wonder very much uh, how certain people would react if the reality of consequence would happen to them. I'm just curious about that. I don't want to talk more about this, though. Let's Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my next note here. So, do you guys know there's another Transformers movie coming out? Now, it's coming out next year, I believe. Uh, now, here's the really screwed up thing. So, there are actually three Transformers movies in the works right now. Yes, really. Three Transformers movies are in the works. Now, I actually have a, something to talk about here, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, before we get to that, I just want to say, let me go ahead and say something that I know is very controversial. I've said it many times before, but I, it bears repeating. I am not anti-Michael Bay. I'm not. I don't think Michael Bay is this horrible, disgusting, terrible person. I think he's actually a very talented director. I think he's just been pigeonholed in what it is he can do, because there are certain types of things Michael Bay is good at. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, yeah, he's good at explosions. Actually, no. Believe it or not. Uh, that's the second unit directing. That's not really Michael Bay stuff. Michael Bay is good at pulling your feel-good, uh, don't really think about it, you know, every man kind of a movie. I know I, I know I have said this more than once, but um, the movie Armageddon is the quintessential Michael Bay movie. Let's actually analyze Armageddon for just a second, okay? We have a movie about down-to-earth down honest, hardworking American men 
who are, you know, the oil drillers. Yes, Deutsch, I am. <laughs> I actually brought that up earlier because people were bitching about it. Sorry. Just honest to goodness, hardworking oil drilling men who are tasked by the eggheads who can't solve the problem in order to solve it for them. In other words, it appeals to that sort of everyman ideal, even if it does it in sort of a ham-fisted kind of a way, right? And it's... Uh, and, and there's a few other things about the movie. I, I, I've been distracted here, and I'm having very difficulty maintaining a single thread of thought right now. So let's just move on. The point being, I'm not anti-Michael Bay. I never have been. Um, yeah, and I liked The Rock, too. So, I mentioned this with regards to Transformers, because most people look at Transformers and they say, Michael Bay is the devil. Um, no. <laughs> The huge, huge, huge problems with Transformers 1 and especially Transformers 2 were all down to the script. I've actually talked about that. I have literally used Transformers 2's script and the, and the sa other scripts written by this, those same people as textbook examples of how not to write a script, okay? Now, I'm not saying Michael Bay is innocent on all this. I just wanted to make that clear because, this is interesting, Michael Bay himself is apparently sick of the Transformers series, and I don't blame him. He was actually sick of it after the second movie. Some of you may not be aware of this, but he wanted to bow out of the series. He was like, I, no, this is, this. I, okay, I'm done, giant robots, no more. And he was literally dragged back by contracts in order to direct the next couple. And he is trying once again to get out after this next one. He does not want to do this anymore. Now here's the problem. When you have a director who actively doesn't want to work on the movie... <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly, Dark Knight. When you have a director who actively does not want to work on a movie, what kind of a directing job... Did I say actor or director? Whatever. What kind of directing job do you think they're going to do? How much quality do you think they're going to be throwing out there with regards to their given work? Add into the fact that we have the Adam Sandler effect, and I think that I don't expect anything good of the next three Transformers movies. Now I know what you're thinking. What the hell is the Adam Sandler's effect? The Adam Sandler effect is uh, Adam, uh, Adam, every Adam Sandler movie basically made in the last decade qualifies for the Adam Sandler effect. It takes a certain amount of money to make an Adam Sandler movie. And, if they, and they've already worked this out on the studio side of things. And if they spend that kind of money, and if they budget it right about so, they will make a profit on it. It will not be a large amount of profit, but it will be a profit. And so they just kind of keep doing it. Because it keeps working. It keeps making money for some reason. It's not a lot of money. It is, in fact, a total lack of ambition. It was basically treading water as far as cinematography goes and, and, and just movie, movie going in general. But they are still making money on Adam Sandler movies. Even Pixels made money. I'm serious. It's strange when you think about it. Adam Sandler himself has got on record as saying, the only reason I keep doing this is because they keep paying me, and they keep paying my friends for it. So I keep making these continued movies to keep being in, in money, and it's just... Why? Transformers, in my opinion, is very much beholden to the Adam Sandler effect. They keep making Transformers movies because they keep making money. And yeah, Myron, drink more water, dude. Come on. Drink. Here, I got. I got a. Here, I got some water right here, Aladdin water apparently. Drink. So they keep making these movies. Uh, and uh, the thing that I find most fascinating about it is, on one level, that's kind of horrible because again, it means people that are people are not being able to really stretch or be ambitious, try new things, try engaging things, you know, we're getting a bit of creative stagnation among certain aspects of the of the Hollywood. And yet on the other hand, the realist in me has to admit that on the it is kind of a good thing that these movies keep getting made. And you're like, "Well, why?" Because a lot of people out there are continuing yes, made fist. Although it depends on where you live. A lot of people out there continue to make money to to be able to come home and pay their bills and take care of their families because movies like Transformers are still being made. 
I mean that sincerely. How many of that special effects team, how many of the second unit directors, how many of the, the props teams, how many of those people are still able to make a paycheck because there's still a demand for big, high-budget movies like this? No, I shouldn't say high-budget. That's right. High, high effects. High effects movies like this. It's a weird situation. I will probably see the next Transformers movie out of curiosity. As of this moment in time, I have no interest in seeing the next two after that. So, yay for Transformers. What are we up to? Uh, five, I think. Transformers 5 is the next one that's coming out. <laughs> is that everything? No, hang on. So, we're not there yet. So, cup, one more thing before I get to the thing that I don't want to talk about. Let's talk about CBS. Can I get some hashtag screw CBSs real quick? I don't even know if I want to go into full detail on what CBS is doing. I really don't. Then that's awesome, Dark Eye. Then that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Oh my god, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. I, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start. This is so stupid. C CBS has pulled up a whole list of their legal requirements for fan films. Any fan-derived work. And they've been lying through their teeth about it, saying, we're in support of fan films, and we want to encourage fan works. And I want to make this clear. What they are doing is the exact opposite of that. You guys know that I am anti-legality. I always have been my whole life. This is nothing new. But the idea of trying to legally hammer out you can have a fan film of up to like 20 minutes length, 15 to 20 minutes duration, cannot have a budget over 50,000, cannot have the support of any previous actors who have ever worked on Star Trek ever. I, the, the list of requirements is asinine and extremely restrictive, as Deutsch just said. It's stupid. What they are basically doing is saying, no one, yeah, no series over two episodes. You can, they're basically cracking down saying, no one shall ever touch Star Trek ever. It is completely off bounds for everyone ever. You wonder how ridiculous it is? They have listed it so vaguely, so incredibly generically, that it is within the realm of possibility that they might come after me for my ruminations on Star Trek, which involves me sitting in front of a, a background talking to you with no footage from the show with no audio from the show it is still within reasonability they might might come after me for that because i technically violate their legal requirements their legal requirements are also uh wrong as in they literally cannot be held up legally let me explain what i mean by this there's this concept called uh a no compete clause okay now, a no-compete clause says, uh, and it, usually a no-complete clause also has a time limit. So, for example, let's say you're working for, um, uh, let's say you're working for, oh yeah, that's another thing. You can't, uh, it's illegal to utilize any uh, reproduction work, like, like uniforms and whatnot, unless it's one officially sold by CBS. By the way, CBS doesn't officially sell any, at least not that I've seen. That's, uh, unless, unless you go to, like, their auctions for the stuff that used to be used on set, which doesn't count. Um, so yeah, uh, let's say that... I lost my train of thought. Where was I going? Where was I going with that? It's gone. <sighs> let's say I, uh, that you're working for a company that does engineering, like big pipe-laying engineering, right? And you say non-complete clause for two years. That means if you are fired or quit or for whatever reason leave your job, for the next two years you are legally required not to do anyone else's pipeline engineering work, okay? That's what a non-complete compete clause means, okay? Now the thing is, in order for that to be valid, in order for that to be legal, you have to actually write that into their contract when they're hired and have them sign it. That's what makes that legal, okay? You cannot five years, 10 years, 15 years after they've quit your company say, oh, by the way, you can't work on any new engineering stuff in the future. 
that's not how that works. But that is exactly what CBS is doing. They are saying that all of the people who worked on Star Trek, and by the way, the way they phrase that, they don't just mean actors. Do you know how many creative people worked on Star Trek in terms of, 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 of sets and, and graphics and writing and script doctoring and makeup and all of these people? Think about the hundreds and hundreds of people that make every given episode of Star Trek. All those people can never, according to CBS, work on any Star Trek anything again ever, unless it's something that they've specifically been hired by CBS to do. They can't do frickin' cosplay or like a miniseries or anything ever. They can't do anything because they used to work at Star Trek. Think about that. That's not legal. They cannot enforce that. Unless they bribe a judge. I'm just going to say that the way it is. Unless they bribe a judge. Unless it actually goes to court and they bribe the judge. And the judge says, okay, sure, you can be a dictatorial idiot. Or they, tr they, they try to sue someone over it and whoever they're trying to sue over it doesn't push back. Either of these events would set precedent, which would mean that now CBS can just, and every other company in the future can say, oh, we own all the right, you, you, know, you can't do anything for this franchise at any time in the future ever, because CBS would have opened the door on that, legally speaking. If a meteor strikes CBS's headquarters tomorrow, just saying. Unfortunately, I don't have much else to share. It's ridiculous and stupid. I'll be blunt. If they come after me at all, the, the Star Trek stuff's getting shut down. I in no way can defend myself legally against CBS. And I'm not even going to try. I don't have the millions of dollars necessary to wage a legal battle against CBS. Okay. Just a heads up. I'll be keeping a very careful eye on things. We'll see what happens. Now, last thing I want to talk about today. I actually don't want to talk about this, but it was requested I talk about it, and you know I've, I've had varying responses about this. Uh, so you guys know I don't really allow controversial topics on my show. It's, some, it's something I've had a long-standing uh, rule about. I actually want to talk about why I have that rule really quick. Um, it's, it's hard to explain properly, but let me put it to you this way. Let's say, uh, you think that, um, video games are dumb, okay? You, you hate video games. You think video games are poisoning the minds of youth. You know, something legitimately wrong with them, okay? And you come to me and you say, Arsh, you know, video games are poisoning youth, blah, blah, blah. And I say, uh, well, no, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, and here's my reason why. Da, 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 da. And you say, well, no. You're poisoning our youth. No, <laughs> here's the problem. If you cannot convince me of your point, that you, because you, you can't, you can't convince me that video games are poisoning children. You can't do this. You can't convince me that video games are a bad thing. You can convince me that they can be a bad thing. We could reach some middle ground there. But the point I'm trying to reach here is that this is not going to be a discussion. This is going to be an argument. This is true in real life. I've had this rule since long before this show has ever existed. I don't discuss controversial topics in real life because 99 times out of 100, it turns into an argument rather than a discussion. One person who's spewing at one person and the other person who's trying to discuss it or is just spewing back. Either way, the only way for there to be an actual discussion here is for two people who both want to have a discussion, and statistically speaking, that is unlikely. Extremely unlikely. So I tend to avoid these kind of topics. So I'm actually not going to talk about the politics of the fact that Britain just left the EU, or is in the process of leaving the EU, more accurately. I'm not going to talk about the politics of that. Uh, I would ask you guys to also not bring up the politics of that. Yeah, what Deutsch says is correct. I'm not interested in drama. I don't want drama. Uh, I, I like melodrama. You know, I like... Stop, evildoer! You know, I like that. But drama is, is just terrible and just leads to bad feelings all around. So, I'm not going to talk about the politics of the matter. I, I will say I do have an opinion on the politics of the matter, which I will not be sharing with you guys. I will be talking about the economics 
of the situation, because I could speak on that with a greater authority. However, I've decided after considerable thought and research not to really go fully in-depth, because that might take me a few hours. The EU-Britain economic situation right now is complicated. Uh, right now, and so I've decided to try and bear this down as simply as I can, but understand that there's, there's no possibility to actually summarize uh, the, the economic situation. I've already told you why, Andre. Um... So there's no possibility uh, to to summarize the economic situation. It's not it's not a thing. It can't happen. Um, Britain right now is a bit of a throughput trade situation. Okay, for those of you who don't actually understand what that means, it means they continue to function based on the continuance of trade. Okay, now the only reason that is economically viable for any given circumstance, being a city or a country or whatever, is because of establishing certain kinds of standards to ensure that some stays and some goes. But Britain itself does not actually produce a particularly large percent of the amount of goods that go through it, hence the throughput concept. Does this make sense? I'm probably explaining this terribly. Um, so them being a trade throughput... You <laughs> damn it, Andrew. Ah, oh, excuse me. Hang on. Hang on. Anyways, the idea of a throughput city or a nation or whatever is not new. You know, this is something that goes back to ancient times that we've had entire organizations that have literally gotten. You've ever heard of the t term "gotten fat off trade"? Well, the way that works is. In order to trade through here, you have to pay to trade through here, okay? Uh, usually in form of tariffs or, uh, you know, taxes or fees or, or whatever. You know, the, the various uh, methods of forcing someone to, uh, to pay in in order to be able to go through you. And you use that money and you turn that money back around into making it easier, quicker, more efficient for people to trade through you. In other words, making it so that more people want to trade through you. Okay, you with me so far? <laughs> So encouraging that kind of throughput and turning that money back around into it, uh, yeah, Egypt is another excellent example, or Alexandria, more specifically, is another ex example of a throughput. Uh, keeping that throughput situation is fantastic, and that throughput makes you a political power. Now, I said I wouldn't talk about the politics of this, but I, and I'm not. I'm just talking about this from an economic perspective. But if you are a situation, you are, if you are a nexus point, be it a city or a country or whatever, that has one uh, specific point of trade, where, where it's a huge amount of the trade of an entire region goes through, then you're going to have more political sway than you otherwise would. Now, let's also presume for a moment that you have just entered a situation where you have pissed off a lot of other people politically. The EU has already gone on record, I don't know if this is true or not, but several member states of the EU have already gone on record saying that they will not accept Britain back into the EU if they want to. That kind of attitude means economic uh, warfare. I've said this before and I've said this again. Economic warfare is just as serious as real warfare because it has just as real, tangible of an effect as real warfare. It's just a lot slower and a lot less harder to point to and say there 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 you know those are the problems that are being caused by it but um <laughs> and uh that kind of economic infighting is going to mean that a country that already <sighs> i hate to use the word relies on because that's such a summary but a huge amount of the economic infrastructure of britain right now relies on that throughput of trade it, the whole nation itself doesn't rely on it. That's, a, that's an exaggeration. That's a summary. But without that constant throughput of trade going through British ports, a huge amount of the infrastructure of Britain would have to be restructured to reestablish itself. Make sense? So if these other countries start pushing for economic warfare against Britain, that throughput is going to go down. And it is possible for Britain to recover from this. It is possible for them to... To, for Britain to restructure a lot of what they're doing, economically speaking, and a lot of that infrastructure. Again, very big emphasis on the infrastructure. Um, 
you know, the people and the jobs and the, the factories and all that fun stuff. Very big emphasis on re restructuring that, and then they will be able to be fine. In fact, it is arguable that Britain would actually be better if everything goes correctly in an economy that is segregate from the EU. But this boils down to something that I've used. I, I said I couldn't summarize the situation, but I actually can. Uh, it's just this is kind of a dumb thing to say, really. This is like saying, duh. It's risky. It is incredibly risky for them to leave the EU. Again, from a purely economic perspective, it is very risky to leave the EU. It is possible for it to work out. This is a risk that can pay off. I have no facts to back this up other than my own statement that I understand economics and I have a tendency to, to be able to look at patterns. It is my opinion that what Britain is trying to do is to restructure economically to be more like the United States economy is. I could speak at length about the United States economy. I understand this economy better than any other in the world. And it is my opinion, I want to keep stressing that point, that, that Britain wants to emulate this economy more literally and directly, and I think that's a bad thing. This economy is the kind of economy that is ultimately self-destructive. I have talked about this so many times in so many aspects of my show. It is all about short-term gains for long-term gloss. That is literally... I, I can actually summarize the U.S. economy. There it is. Bam. Short-term gain, long-term loss. Chewing through resources, chewing through services, chewing through people, and trying to... I, I hate to keep quoting Babylon 5. A, a paper fantasy. So much of the economy of the U.S. doesn't actually exist. <laughs> we say it does. We have papers. We have computers that say it exists. And I'm not talking about electronic money. I'm talking about non-existent money. You know, fake money. I've talked about this concept before. Most people don't actually understand the concept of fake money. Most people don't understand the concept of that. They think I mean, like, the fact that if I... I'm not going to actually literally pull up, but you know, if I pull up a credit card here, this is fake money. That's not what I mean. A, a credit card is real money. But there is such a thing as fake money. You realize that there are people who can actually buy debt, right? That's a thing. And that's like at the ground floor of fake money. This is my greatest worry, personally, for Britain. I don't want Britain to try and emulate the United States economic model. The United States economic model is disgusting. <laughs> it is self-destructive. It will inevitably fall apart. The only way to actually balance the U.S. economy is to fundamentally restructure it. And this is my final opinion. It is within the realm of possibility that this whole completely restructuring the British infrastructure, their economic infrastructure, might lead to a greater, very long-term gain by completely distancing themselves from other markets, which, if they dis disintegrate or fall apart, would take Britain with them. And this is my personal hope for Britain. You know, I, I wish you guys the best. I, I shouldn't even have to say that. You guys are awesome. But, you know, our, our, our brothers across the pond and all that. But uh, that is a possibility. And it is possible that this kind of a impact of segregating from the EU might be the impetus necessary for change. And it is possible that change is good. In a very strange way, I am envious because the US has no impetus for change. We have no reason to change our economy over here other than the fact that it needs to be changed. There is nothing forcing it, you know. The last time we were forced to change the US economy was World War II. Think about that for a moment. You could say a lot about it. Same to say, you could say the same about a lot of countries, actually. <sighs> yeah, I was going to say the value of British currency and British goods has plummeted. But, uh, yeah. That, like I said, that is the the purely economic perspective on things. I am trying very hard not to talk about the political aspect of things, not just because of the obvious reasons, but because it's my own rule. 
Granted, I have no problem breaking my own rules, because they're rules. They're not in stone. But that rule does exist for a reason. <sighs> um, I actually think that's all I have to talk about that. And that's all my notes for this week. Let me double check. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything. Actually, I have one last thing to say. Why the hell did they call it Brexit? Like, that's such a dumb comment. That's such a dumb, uh, uh, shorthand. Like, the only thing I could think of that by that was British exit. It's the only thing I could come up with for Brexit. British exit. I mean, why would you call it that? Why not call it something, you know, I, I don't know. I got nothing. I got nothing. Anywho, I'm going to go ahead and chop this off. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to keep working today. I'm stuffy as hell, but regardless, I will be seeing you guys at some point in the future. Um, later from now. By the way, get hoip one week from now. There will, uh, there will be a lore week next Sunday, but it'll be shorter because it's le it, it'll be happening like literally a couple of hours. Or excuse me, like one hour, I think, before SGDQ. So, just a heads up on that. Either way, see you next time, guys.